Today we are on chapter 7, so let's go to God in prayer. Father, we love you. We worship you. There is no other God but you, Father. And even though we pray every day and we call you Father, we never forget what a privilege it is to know you, the God who created the heavens and the earth, as our Father. For before, in the past, we were heathens who do not know the reality of the true and living God. And now not only do we know you, but we have the privilege to know you as our Father. So Father who are in heaven, we come before you acknowledging your presence, your work, your power in these modern days. In these days when men and women look at the Bible as just stories or even some mythologies, we know you are the God of the Bible. The only God who created all the heavens and the earth, upon which there is no other God. And then here we stand, Father, on the earth, your footstool. And we continue to proclaim your word. <clears throat> and the nearness of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We live in this last hour in which you are calling your people to come and purify themselves that they may know your call after 2,000 years <clears throat> here you are calling your people to get ready for your coming to be among those who have faith and whose love do not wax cold you have called us to be your bride. You have called us to sanctify ourselves, our bodies, our mind, our soul, and all of our spirits unto you, that you may dwell in these last days in our lives as a temple of the living God. You are building a temple, not made with hands, but that which is made by your Spirit. As we consider your Word, let your Word be true and strong in our lives. As we consider your Son Jesus, who came to live on this earth and spoke words by which we can know you. As we study His Word, grant the Spirit of wisdom and revelation to open the eyes of the understanding that all may know you, may know all the hope of your calling, all the riches of your inheritance that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and all the greatness of this resurrection power that raised Jesus Christ on the day, and that now flows through our spirit, our soul, and our body. This pure power of the Holy Spirit that we have in us. Cause us to know all these, Father. And we covenant to always give you all the glory, all the worship and honor. For unto you all things belong. We are yours, O Father. Receive our love and our adoration. Thank you, Father, for breaking the bread of life to us even now. Thank you. With all our hearts, we thank you, and we bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, we continue in chapter 7, and I read a few verses, and then uh, i like to tie it together. And it began to tell us how Jesus knew that his life was in danger. Now, we know that this is like, the beginning part of his ministry because the first five chapters were before John was in prison 
and by chapter 6 it synchronized with the others and you begin to have the uh, he must have done a lot of ministry in Capernaum and a few times he went down to Jerusalem in Jerusalem he did a few signs and wonders which is why Nicodemus came to him because he says no man can uh, no, uh, no man can do these signs and wonders unless it comes from God but people are not interested whether someone is from God people are more interested in his time in whether they conform to their image of how God should present himself I mean humans telling God how you should present yourself to us and when God shows up and did not present himself the way they expect they rejected God the same as today God is trying to call his people and like Jesus say in every generation God sent prophets God sent them men and women of God they persecute they kill, uh, they put aside, and they hearken not to the word of God, and thus it makes the judgment of God more severe upon them. People need not be outwardly, seemingly like a rotten sinner in order to receive the greatest judgments of God. The Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus' time received the greater judgment. We read about these people today, but every single or that one of them who once was alive, today await a judgment greater than the judgment of many sinners. Because the greatest sin is the rejection of God. So here, after these things in verse 1 it says Jesus walked in Galilee for he would not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him it says uh, why are the Jews seeking to kill him now the background is actually chapter 5 because not many people know about the miracle of 5,000 only those who are mainly for the northern area of Israel. The people in Jerusalem, they have their own thinking, they have their own um, approach to things. They're more religious and of course they probably look down on all the other people from all the other towns. That's why they say, huh, you're Galilean, kind of thing, look down on the people. Because they think that they are above everybody else. When did this killing things became very obvious from John chapter 5 so you need a little bit of background again and uh, uh, the, uh, before I turn to that if you look down uh, let's say Jesus tells them here in verse 21 in verse 21 see that Jesus said to them I did one work what, one thing that he did was very controversial and that one thing they're still mad about him they cannot forgive him for doing that one thing that was against all their tradition what was the one thing that he did that was from chapter 5 in John chapter 5 and uh, the healing of the man who was at the pool of Bethesda. In John chapter 5, uh, there's a man whom, whom Jesus healed, but Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. And at first he didn't know who it was who healed him, but later on he found out what, it was Jesus, and in verse 15 of John 5, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Then in verse 16, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So they still had that remembrance. And uh, their unforgiveness was indeed very great. So here in John chapter 7, because when you go through John chapter 6, you might have forgotten about this thing. Because you went into the, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking in water, and they tried to make him king, and all those things. You might have forgotten uh, the story that was continuously on in Jerusalem. They still remember that he healed on the Sabbath day. 
Now we also know, based on chapter 3 of John, that he did more than one miracle. And most of his miracles were done on the Sabbath day. It's like almost like, you know, it's almost like the Jews say, you know, you shall not wear green shirt, Jesus wore a green shirt kind of thing. And he says, you know, don't do anything on the Sabbath day. Jesus does all the things on the Sabbath day. And he said, he didn't choose to do it, the Father do so, he does it. And they even tell him, you know, there are six days you can heal. Why want to heal on the Sabbath day and make us angry kind of thing? You know, God couldn't care whether we're angry or not. You know, sometimes people think they're bigger than God, and people think they see on the seed of God, and they begin to do things uh, that, that until they themselves are uh, opposing God. Imagine that. People who are supposed to represent God are opposing God. So we look at chapter 7 again. Uh, this thing Jesus walked in Galilee, and he spent most of his time in Galilee. He only go a few times now to Jerusalem. For he would not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to hear him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was near. Remember what the feast of tabernacles was. The feast of tabernacles was um, uh, during the time when uh, the Jews would uh, take uh, uh, little palm branches and they would, they would make little temporary shelters and uh, it was to remind them that they once lived in tents, almost like the Passover celebration where they once were in Egypt. And here is a reminder that uh, they once lived in tents, and it is celebrated, and the Feast of Tabernacles in fulfillment was fulfilled only in uh, Revelations chapter 20, when uh, New, New Jerusalem came down, and then the voice proclaimed, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So the ultimate finale. So in a sense, the Feast of Tabernacles celebrates New Jerusalem coming down in typology. Every Jewish feast is a special event that will be fulfilled. For example, when they celebrate the Passover, which started when they, on the night that they were coming out from Egypt, the night before the 10th plague, when they sacrificed the lamb, it was the 14th day of Abib, the religious month. So it was about like the third month, and God says, you shall count this month as the first month from now onwards. And the Feast of Passover point to something, something very significant. Each of the feasts point to something very, very, very significant. So, let's do a little simple test, whether you're up to speed in your Bible knowledge. Come on, my, my computer is too slow, okay. I hope they invent something else is faster. All right. You know, when I finish uh, translating the Bible, I might give something to Olive Tree, but I think once I have my Bible translated, I will probably sell a Bible with something like that. I will call it an iPad. So something like that, that you can maybe use it as a phone, use it as a Bible, and use it for notes, and use it for other things, you know, and all the Bible is there, and all the cross-references. So you punch a button, you get all the cross-references coming, and it must, must work faster than this. Okay, here we go, anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe which battery lasts very long. <laughs> maybe solar power too. Okay. So that during 2021 9, when there's no sunlight, mm -hmm. you still can power it with your torchlight, anyway. Okay, here we go. These are the fees. Fees of, no, I'm not going to use the word fees or other repetitious. Uh, so let's say fees of. Pass over to Feast of Unleavened Bread. We shall together third Feast of First Fruits. F hey, I put fruit. Okay, okay, first fruits. Uh. Fruit first or whatever. Okay. Ah. Pentecost. Okay. 
trumpets. Sixth one is a day of atonement. Atonement. Seven. Feast of Tabernacle. Since we touched a teaser net tabernacle. You need to have this knowledge inside of you. Uh, each of the feasts are very interesting. But when God does something on this planet, it points to something significant. Even simple things. Remember when uh, Adam and Eve fell, straight away when God judged the serpent, and God makes a, a statement that says that, you know, uh, He will bruise your heel, but you shall crush it. And that point to Jesus crushing Satan completely. And it points forward to the day Jesus rose from the dead and crushed Satan and take death. Now, I already told you some things. Feast of Tabernacles point to New Jerusalem. And for that, I just quickly give you the scriptures to show that it's actually fulfilled. 20. Okay. Let's go to chapter 20. And, oh, chapter 20 is a word. Chapter 21. And here's New Jerusalem coming down. And was descending from heaven, having all the glory description that is there. And so there's a description of um, New Jerusalem. And that's a, a beautiful scene. Look at verse 3, the, the tabernacle proclamation. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. That's an important event. And so, that points to New Jerusalem, Revelation 21. And um, Pentecost, you know, is Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given. Holy Spirit pour out. So, you should have number one. Passover. Anybody? Jesus died on the cross. He was a lamb. He gave himself. Passover was a cross. It predicts Jesus dying on the cross. And first fruit, first Corinthians tell you is the resurrection, which is an important event, which leaves the in between what's the special thing about the unlivable bread. What's the unleavened bread? No signature. Eh? No signature. It is an event. It is an event. Now the event leads to certain things. See that the event of Jesus dying on the cross. There's an event, correct? Then there's an event of the Holy Spirit coming down. There's the event of New Jerusalem. There's the event of the resurrection. Now, I agree in the sense of no sin nature, all this, it's all inside. But what's the event? Crucifixion. Crucifixion is in number one. Passover is a crucifixion. What's the unleavened bread? Okay, okay. Anybody? Yes, when the Lord said, remember the event. This 
is my body. Jesus' body is unleavened bread, which is broken for you. This you will eat as much as you can. That was the new covenant. Now the new covenant, what was actually Jesus' body? Jesus' body is the Word made flesh. So it included the Word of God. It included the Logos of God. It included the Rhema of God. But everything comes through the New Covenant. And remember there are two scriptures on the New Covenant also. Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, correct? And what's a Hebrew 8 and Hebrew 10 emphasize? The Word of God becoming your flesh so that you don't need anyone to teach you. Isn't that true? Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. Written in your heart and in your mind. Put in your heart, mind and in your heart. Correct? Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. Which again point to the new covenant. So on the day that Jesus took the cup, say this is my blood, this is my cup, this is my body, that's the event. The event is so important that sometimes he take people back in time, like the Apostle Paul who was not there. He took him back in time to show him the event. So that Paul says in 1 Corinthians that I received from the Lord Jesus that on the night that he was betrayed. See, he saw it exactly and he described it. It is an event. Let me point to the Day of Atonement. It is... The event is the rapture. The day the high priest goes in, the secret place, is the rapture. And that leaves only one event. The Feast of Trumpets. It has to be a special event. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Marriage Supper of the Lamb is when we are caught up. And between here to here, it's the Lord Supper. Ah, uh, actually between here, some between here and uh, the second coming of Jesus, which is between here, that takes place. There is an event, blowing of the trumpets. When the trumpet sound, you have a clue in the Old Testament. Hebrews 12. When the trumpet sounds in Mount Zion, I need a feast of trumpets in Mount Zion, which in, is a special event. Think about it. The day that the stone touch the ten toes, is that an event? It is a special event. That's when the Kingdom of God comes forth and manifests on earth. That's the special event. Remember what happened in Mount Sinai. So you move from Mount Sinai, which is filled with the sound of trumpets. Not trumpets blown by humans, but trumpets from the Lord. And the, the corresponding event in the New Testament is Mount Zion. He says you have come to Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? The Kingdom of God. Read Hebrews 12. Mount Zion equals the kingdom of God. It says all things will be shaken except that which is the kingdom of God. So that event when the stone touched the earth is a special event that is in our time. In the days of the Ten Toes. You see, each of these is an event. Each event does impact something in our life. And each event got a lot of Christian application. 
but each is a special time when spiritual time and natural time coincide. Right? On the day of Pentecost was a specific time on earth. When Jesus died on the cross was a specific time on earth. When Jesus rose from the dead was a specific time on earth. When Jesus made a new covenant was a specific time on earth. When the, uh, the rapture takes place, it is a specific time on earth that is kept secret by God. And when the kingdom of God when a stone touched the planet Earth and the saints receive the kingdom of God, there is a special event on Earth. And we are privileged to see that and be part of that. So, having seen that these are all special events, we go back to uh, John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, Whenever things happen around an event, it points to something in that event. For example, when you want to study more about the rapture, study all the things that are involved in the high priest going into the Holy of Holies. On that day, the high priest must be in his full gear. His turban, his inner clothing, his outer clothing. He must put all the best clothing. And before he does it, he needs the animal sacrifice, he needs to wash, he needs to do everything. And then the blood must be sprinkled seven times and all those things, completion. So each of those little, little things point to all the preparation necessary for the rapture. Which is why we saw in vision that in the time of the rapture, we have a seven-day worship. See, every single thing will be fulfilled. You cannot see it clearly on the earth, but when you look from heaven, you realize God has given shadows that are cast by the real event from the future into the present so that we can see the shadow form and look forward to it. And uh, <clears throat> so, it was in verse 2, the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. And then his brothers. Who are the brothers of Jesus? They were people like Jude and James. Do you know that the writer of Jude and the writer of the book of James, the Epistle of James, are actually the half brothers of Jesus? They are the they are older than Jesus because um by the time uh, Joseph, married, uh, uh, Joseph married Mary, uh, Joseph was already a widower. And he had these big uh, kids, and many of them were much older than Mary. And so by the time Mary, Mary married Joseph, uh, Mary was actually the youngest in the whole house. But the big kids like James and Jude, they have all, you know, uh, gone to various places. They might marry and got their own family and all those things. So here, these people, they still are there influencing the family. And they're much older than Jesus. And they might have been in a carpenter shop with him in the same business that Joseph had. And these people at first did not believe in him. These are his half-brothers. Who knows? Among them could be James and Jude, who later on believed. Isn't it marvelous? Later on, James believed and became one of the leaders of the church. And uh, the, the apostle James was martyred. So the James that you hear later, quite prominent, one of the pillars of the church, was actually the half-brother of Jesus, who became faithful. But here they were before they believed in Him. So do not, do not give up when you see people don't believe. Because you never know. Who knows that these brothers will one day become believers in Jesus and part of the church. You never know how God moved. Anyway, his own family brothers said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea. They're your disciples. You see, your disciples, <laughs> as if Jesus separate from them. Your disciples 
also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. They were challenging him. For neither did his brothers believe in him. They say that because they didn't believe in him. They were like half mocking, half challenging. A prophet is not accepted in his own family. So that phenomena was there. And Jesus replied to them something that is interesting that we're going to consider. Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Compare, is, the, the translation in this chapter is actually quite simple. Uh, not much uh, variations. Like sometimes it varies a lot. And uh, the epistles I find easier in a way to translate, although there are lots of translation, but it's easier to translate than the epistle. The epistle you've got to consider every root word and the nuances because most doctrines are formed from the epistles. And uh, so that's why we took some time. Uh, maybe after this we might have to take a break in the epistles again. And uh, <coughs> we've been doing two continuations of uh, Gospels. So, <coughs> Jesus said that, my time, uh, your time is ready, my time is not yet come, it hasn't come yet. It says, the world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it, that its works are evil. Now the Feast of Tabernacles is usually a celebration that most Jews partake in. They would travel all the way to Jerusalem, that's where they expected Jesus to go. Let's go on to the next line. You go up to this feast, he says. I'm not going up yet to this feast. Again, he says, for my time is not yet full. Ah, that part we want to consider. Small little nuances. So in verse 8, he says, my time is not yet full. It's from the word plero, which is a normal word for fullness or complete. Or feel. So at first I look at it and say, could it be translated, my time is not yet fulfilled? And um, uh, because the word come is not actually inside. Like it says, uh, my time has not yet fully come. But the word come is not inside, so I cannot put the word come. So you're stuck with the, the place that Jesus says, my time is not yet Full. And the word plero means to be complete or to be filled up. And here's a strange thing. When his brothers has gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it is in secret. And then the Jews were looking for him and say, Where is he? Oh, I got to capitalize that. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. And then, like he was secret, he was there, but yet people didn't know he was there. And it all has to do with this word, just that one little word. My time is not full. But earlier he says, my time is not yet come. Your time is always ready. Anytime you go to do what you can. Now he's contrasting. He, the way he spent his time with the way they spend their time. Because the brothers say, why don't you go down and, and go openly. And, and Jesus says, my time is not yet come. Your time is always ready. That means whatever you want to do, you can do. But what I want to do, Jesus is saying, I cannot do. It looks like Jesus was a born servant to the Father. He is not allowed to do anything and he will not do anything unless the Father give him permission. And up to that point, the Father has not has told him and instructed him not to go openly. And why is this so? And you must know, the Jews want to kill him. Now we know that nobody can kill Jesus until Jesus' time to be killed. But have you noticed something about persecution? 
something about persecution. When persecution arises, you must know what God wants you to do. Sometimes you're not supposed to move. Like the apostles in the first persecution, say everyone flee except the apostles because it was God's will for them to stay behind Jerusalem. And if it's God's will for them to stay behind, God protected them. Uh, we used to have this debate last time in seminary. What do you do in a persecution? Do you exercise authority like the three boys in Nebuchadnezzar's time and expect God to protect you? Or do you run? If you flee, are you a coward? Or if you stay, are you correct? What do you do when things are difficult and there is persecution? The question is not Shakespeare's to be or not to be. That is not the question. The question to stay or not to stay, to go or to stay in a persecution. And when we were having a debate, because in the early days, uh, people were afraid of the domino effect of you know, communism taking over, Southeast Asia you know, coming down, but praise God, that didn't happen in the end, communism was defeated. And uh, in the end, that, that question lingers. And I remember in the seminary, when we had that little discussion, we didn't have a conclusion. Some were saying this and some were saying that. And, uh, but today, I have an answer from the Bible. And let's cross-reference a little bit to find some interesting understanding and doctrine in terms of persecution. Because this message could be heard by people from all over the, over the world. In some sections of the world today, there's persecution. In some sections of the world, there's freedom to preach the gospel. But things are changing. Nothing is permanent. And one needs to know what to do at each time. As you know, there was a persecution that arose in the time of um, Paul, after Stephen, uh, the persecution arose after uh, Stephen was appointed and then Stephen was martyred. Chapter 7 was Stephen's, um, uh, chapter seven was Stephen's uh, sermon. In chapter 8, led by the Apostle Paul, who later was formerly called Saul, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered. In other words, people were scattered. They fled the persecution. And they arose in Jerusalem. So they, they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Do you notice in verse 1? Except the apostles. See the word except there? Except the apostles. Because it was not God's will for the apostles to move yet. The apostles survived the first wave of persecution by Paul. The first wave of persecution died down when Paul was converted. Then the second wave of persecution came under Herod. But each time, the persecution did not last. If you read church history, in the end, the persecutors are judged by God and killed. God allowed them. To, to in the end die. Some of them die horrible death. And uh, during the time of Savonarola, his story was an interesting one. He is one of the early preachers of Reformation before Martin Luther. Not as famous because he got killed. But he preached and in the end he was he was burned and martyred. But but before he be, before he, he left, he said, in one year, he says uh, the governor and uh, the and one bishop who was persecuting him and the pope would die. And uh, 
in the end, when two of them died in the year, uh, what the provincial guy was still left, he came on his knees and he begged for forgiveness. But by that time, it was too late. Uh, he was really fearing and trembling when he saw that. You read, read the story of Savonarola. No persecutor lives forever. When one chooses to persecute the church, God marks them, convert or die. So most that. So the first wave of, of persecution, which was by Saul, thank God Saul was converted. And after Saul was converted, see, he's a terrible fella. Verse 3, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging all men and women, committing them to prison. You know the story. So those who were scattered, they started preaching the gospel. And in the end, <coughs> um, Saul was converted in chapter 9. Uh, and then you see at the end of the story, and uh, after Saul was converted, uh, everyone was shocked. Uh, three years later, they were still stunned and shocked. And verse 31, the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria had peace and were edified. So the persecution rose and died down. Then a second persecution arose. Later on, usually the devil had to raise uh, what I call a kingpin. And the next kingpin of the persecution was uh, Herod. Herod tried to be clever. Look at chapter 12. This time the persecutor was a king. Now about that time, the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Now this is the second wave of persecution. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he arrests him, he delivered them the false gods, and you know how God protected him. But he managed to kill one of the apostles. So one of the apostles died. And um, you read what happened to him later in chapter 12. He died a violent death. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Remember what Saul was warned. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you kicking against the goats? The goats is a sharp object like a needle-like thing and like he's telling you're kicking against that needle-like thing it's like kicking against a, a nail and Saul doesn't realize he's actually going to kill himself he says Herod uh, was very angry and then in the end uh, on one fine day when people proclaim him at his peak at his peak God struck him down God struck him down. So here's the thing. I come to understand that under persecution, it is God's will for some people to go. Whereas it is God's will for some people to stay. And maybe some people are chosen to be martyred. But everyone must find out what God's will is. So one cannot judge the other and say, <clears throat> you know, you're wrong, you're trying to run, you're a coward. And then the one who's going might go to the one who stayed. I think you're being foolish. See, you can always throw words at each other. But the fact is, everyone must hear what God wants them to do. Because there's only one place that protects you. It is not an earthly place. It is being in God's perfect will. As long as Peter was doing God's perfect will, even under Herod, he could not be killed. Now, this background we need when we go back to John chapter 7. <clears throat> you see, in John chapter 7, the Jews want to kill him, correct? So once the Jews want to kill him, Jesus needs to know. Does God want me to go down to Jerusalem? Let me tell you, if Jesus missed God, the devil would have straight away taken him. 
So even Jesus has to make sure he walk on the walk of God. And it was God's will for him to remain incognito, secret. Because the Jews are looking for him. You don't have to paint a bull's eye on you and say, I am Jesus, I'm the one you're looking for, kind of thing. You don't have to do that unless God asks you to do that, to appear. So, you notice something about our Lord Jesus? Now, the ending of this story in uh, John is uh, not chapter 7 only, but uh, if, if, if you don't mind, I look straight to chapter 8, which I also finished translating, where he confronted the Jews. And he say, he look at verse 59. They took up stones to throw at him. So they were really going to give him a public killing. But Jesus suddenly just hid himself. And then when he went out of the temple, he went through the midst of them, they cannot find him. It's like he became invisible. This is an interesting thing. Look at how God protected him. Now here, somehow he became hidden in a crowd. And it was the Holy Spirit. And they could not see him when he went through their midst. Which is different from another group that want to actually kill him, his hometown people. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 6, or Mark chapter 5, okay, let's look at Luke 6. In his hometown, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6, oh, okay, let's look at him when he says the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Okay, Luke 6 uh, happened to be the synagogue. Stretch for... Um, nope, not good enough. Mark 5. Okay, Mark chapter 5. Mark 5 leading all the way to Mark chapter 6. I, why did I go to Luke? It was chapter 6 of Mark all the time. Okay, here he is. And um, it tells you, uh, in Mark chapter 6 at the beginning part, okay, this scrolling is going to be slowly, okay, there you go. He came to his own country, and blah, 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 he preached to them, uh, and he says, he, and he says there, he could not do much mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick folk, and they marvel because of their unbelief. And that uh, small little incident that he has back in his hometown, You have here, let's look at his own little hometown. Okay. Let's highlight. When they want to throw him off the cliff. Okay. Luke, yeah, Luke 4. Okay, yeah, his hometown. So here's a hometown. And it says, in they heard they were filled with wrath, and rose and thrust him out of the city. They led him actually to the hill of their, where the city was built, and they were about to throw him down. And then something happened, and he walked through, and they could not kill him. So Jesus has faced dangerous moments before. And I just want to point to a few. See, sometimes we think that Jesus' life because he was uh, son of God, 
that uh, just because he was son of God, he can do anything he wants and nobody could come near him. I want to show that there were a few times when the Bible recorded clearly that an ordinary person would have been killed. Don't forget, no, they sort of hustle him all the way to the hill and they're about to throw him down the hill. Something of the anointing of God came upon him and of course, he didn't hide. The Bible didn't say he hide. So it's publicly, something happened and the fear of God came on them and he just walked through them. And no one dared to kill him because it was not his time to die. Now here in John chapter 7, it's interesting because he's going into an environment that the people are about to, wanting to kill him. They're actually looking to kill him. Remember, at the end of chapter 8, they took up stones and they were about to throw at him. And that is why he says, Your time is always ready. I cannot go where the Holy Spirit wants me to go, except where God tells me to go. So all of Jesus' time, where he is to go, when he is to go, how he is to go, has to be led by the Spirit. And I believe his story teaches us wisdom. Because one fine day, as the Antichrist rises in certain area, some of us will be the pristine zone, nothing to worry. But some of you will be asked to go to places to preach the gospel. And as you go to different places, you need to be wise as serpents, harmless as dove. You don't have to purposely paint a bull's eye every time as you enter the town. In some places, you have to go discreetly. And that's the way of the Spirit. In fact, in the year 2012, when uh, the first seven thunders were going through the seven churches, of which we're going to go to seven churches again in February 2020 next year, under the instruction of the Holy Spirit, um, and there was another time. Okay, in 2025, we also must be in Israel for some special thing. Uh, I'll tell you more in, in time to come. But uh, in 2020, uh, we are to be in Pergamos. Uh, after the, uh, the church tour is an addition that, that the Holy Spirit allows us to add. But um, some of us will be told by God to go to different places and you need to be led by the Spirit. That Sometimes you got to go discreetly. And then sometimes they might tell you to go openly. Everyone must be led by the Spirit, just as Jesus was led by the Spirit here. So he told his brothers, at first when he told them, my time is not yet come. Let's look at the translation. And uh, so when he says his time hasn't come, and uh, then in verse 8, let's consider verse 8 again. He says, my time is not yet full. There is something there. Now remember this, there is no word come there, but some sort of a sense of a fullness of time. I want to use this as an illustration in another way. Do you know that in everything there is such a thing called a ripeness? Ripeness? Like apples growing on a tree cannot be eaten until they are ripe. If you try to eat it before, it doesn't taste good. Guava, for those of you in uh, tropical countries. Also, rambutans. Also, avocado, avocado yes. <laughs> Coconuts. Everything must reach a certain level before you can actually harvest it. Bananas or anything. It, eh? mangoes or anything. There's a certain ripeness, correct? Now, try to think about your action as a ripeness. Sometimes it's not right to do certain things here. It hasn't come to the fullness for you to do. And you must wait upon the Lord to do it. Just like, for example, 
A lot of people want God to do judgment or, or do things against evil. But there is also a rightness of time when God will judge, correct? In Genesis chapter 15, he says the, 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 the iniquity of the Amorites haven't reached its fullness. Isn't that interesting? It hasn't reached a fullness for God to do something. And the same way in Daniel, it says that uh, when the iniquity is full, then only something will happen. Now, it works for good and bad. We talk about the bad thing, it reaches a fullness, then God steps in. In the good thing, Jesus has a sense of something is full. So he did not have that sense. See, I'm interested in what was Jesus feeling. What was Jesus sensing? Jesus could sense that there was no anointing upon to do anything. The, the fullness was not there to act. So he went incognito. And he waited on the Lord. And so, let's read on. Uh, <clears throat> so he went up in secret. Because he did not, and let me convey to you, he did not sense the fullness. There is such a thing as you must sense something is full before you do. Yes? Um, would you say being transfigured takes a higher level of glory than passing through the midst? When, when God allowed him to pass through the midst, would you say, would that would thing? Okay. Question coming for those online. Um, would, you, would you consider being, uh, sorry, being transported from one place to another is a higher level of glory? than when Jesus passed through their midst, or would you say that's the same? Oh, I would consider it definitely higher. Yeah, so we can also be transported. Now, something will start happening on the day that we... The strange thing about transportation is the consistency of revelation. I saw it in my spirit way back in 1997 when the Lord told me and showed me the last week before Jesus came. And now I knew the last week was 7 times 7. I saw it like Daniel saw it. It was so clear. And I left Malaysia. I was, uh, and, uh, I was not sure what my future was. And, uh, but then the angel was there and appeared in a, in, in a dream vision. And they showed me the, the last week before Jesus came, the rapture. And I, I was asking people to go to and fro, sending people forth in teams. The strange thing, I was the one sending out, sending them. I, I had no idea who I, what, what the future call was. And then some of them would take one, two, three, four steps and they got transported. Some of them go by conventional means. And so I saw transportation. And then in this revival, when we began to receive uh, the Seven Thunders message, uh, the first seven thunders also, and I recorded a lot, although we didn't pass all the revelations out, uh, there were a lot of revelations of transportation. And here's the thing, <clears throat> even in the first seven thunders time, we saw that we had the power to transport when we want. It didn't just happen by accident. It's like we had the power to transport ourselves. We could appear and disappear. And interestingly, when the second seven thunders who came and went, he also saw transportation and the same power. And then I myself had my revelations where I saw that we have the key and the power to transportation anytime we want in our control. And you have, among your first few visions, was transportation. Remember the horse, the chariot, the chariot and you put in the key, the key was love. And that was transportation. So you have almost like four, five witnesses that witness that in this revival, we will progress to the, to the level where we can learn how to transport. So those, who, those who are weaker in the faith, will they be able to pass through? Or pass in the midst of... Uh... Will that be happening or just Okay. Those weak in the faith might be. <coughs> <laughs> no, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, 
it definitely needs a level of faith. I think to pass through still needs strong faith. So those weak in the faith have to rely on others whose faith are stronger. And it's interesting that our, all our faith have to grow. And so it's important in this time to grow our faith. To grow our faith. Because when, when the open door comes, you'll find you need to know everything that you have learned. And so that's why during the time before the door opens, that's why we have to master every key and everything that we need to know. And so there were many ways in which you're... I know that Jesus could transport himself. Uh, both the seven thunders and myself saw that in Jesus, when we look back at Jesus' life, we saw that Jesus could transport himself, but he does it secretly. Only occasionally you see it very public, like uh, the, the last session, when we talk about Jesus stepped into the boat, the boat was immediately transported to the shore. And it, it seems like he kept that until the fullness of time. But in this end time, we will master that. But at the same time, we have to master this. I call it, for lack of a better word, a sense of fullness which is like a sense of a ripeness that is right to do something. Like, like for example, you guys know that I could go traveling countries today and do evangelistic meetings. I've done that before. I could go start from small meetings to large meetings and, 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 and don't pass any church and just travel and do traveling ministry. But the time is not yet for that. There is a certain ripeness that one must feel. And so it's important for us to understand how to feel the ripeness or the fullness. Where Jesus says, my, my time is not yet plural or full. Something is not complete. So he cannot do it. And when Jesus said that, Jesus didn't actually say he was not going. He just said, my time hasn't come yet. See, they, they, you remember what the brothers are doing? The brothers are pushing him. Pushing him to do something that he said not time to do yet. If he followed his brothers, he would have died. Even though he was Jesus, because he would be disobedient. Never let your family member or somebody or anybody you know, push you out of your timing. Because let me tell you, the person who can spoil your timing are people who are close to you. And because people far away, you're not going to listen to them. But the people who are near you, who cannot sense the timing of God, they will tell you, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. When you don't feel you're ripe yet, the fullness of time. And you'll be making more mistakes than you realize. Jesus could sense this fullness. His own brothers was pushing him. And he pushed back. When people push you, push back. You don't have to do what people ask you to do because you're responsible for your own life. And so, Jesus identified that, he went secretly, okay, let's go on. So everybody was asking, where is he? And he was in their midst and they didn't know. I wonder how Jesus disguised himself. <laughs> of course, in those days, they would put a shawl and, uh, you know, and sort of, they were wearing a long kind of um, um, robe. And all the Jews might look the same. <laughs> all familiar, like they're all, you go to China, all the Chinese look the same. And <laughs> so, and they all, you know, they all could be dressed and, you know, Jesus would be there attending. And, and nobody recognized Jesus until when the fullness of time, suddenly on one of the things, Jesus suddenly stood up and then he says, let him who is thirsty come unto me. Everybody said, hey, isn't this him? Right? Because there is such a thing as following the timing of the Holy Spirit right 
to the dot. You know what I mean, right to the dot, to the second. That kind of timing is very important, right to the second. Sometimes when you walk with miracles, and you walk in the miracle, miraculous, it's something like that. And <clears throat> so here, when they were asking him, and here is where all the people were saying different things. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. Others said, he deceives the people. Okay, I'm going to write down all those things people say about him, including the Jews. Okay, we finish this part. And here we are. Yeah, you see, I got this idea that one day we're going to have something that looks like an iPad. It could be anything. Where we have all our Logos KJV Bible inside with all the cross reference, all the commentary. And when you press something like we press the arc, and then we got description of how big the arc was uh, from our downloads and all those things. Plus, all the messages are inside. <laughs> that would be nice, right? Uh, and all the messages are inside. So you, wow, you press this, any topic under the sun. <laughs> so you can be offline. Wow. Let's, let's work towards that. And you say, how, how, how? Hey, wait, nowadays, have you noticed how much the terabytes are coming down? And, uh, yeah, and, and you know, that's why nowadays nobody sells cassette tapes anymore. No, nobody sells DVD anymore. Because last time DVD can still take, because messages are being squashed under MP3. And uh, in one CD, you got lots of messages. And so things have changed. But, well, for the future. Anyway, these are the things people say about Jesus. And let me say three lines. The Jews, the people, and what we call others. <laughs> others. I don't know who the others are, but there's always different people who are commenting. So in this chapter, as we do, let's look at some of the statements that they are being made. So first they ask, where is he? He, uh, and uh, so, okay, where is he? They are much more. Some said, he is good. Okay, okay, so we got one there. Okay, he is good. Jesus is good. And then others say, he deceived people. So they call him a deceiver. Okay, the bad thing, let's write in black. Eh? Okay, he deceives the people. Don't forget, no, they are telling, talking about Jesus. And, um, okay, let's read on in the translation. But no one spoke openly of him, for everyone was afraid of the Jews. <laughs> Look, uh, they are afraid of the Jews. And you know, today is the same thing. Many people who have heard this message, their heart tell them this is the truth. But they are always afraid. They are afraid if they say, I believe! Boom, the stones start coming to them. Or persecution. Or being ostracized. Or being ridiculed. You always have people who are fearful. It's okay. People who are fearful are people who are weak in faith. They don't have so much faith. There are always different levels of people. Then, in the middle of the, the feast lasts for seven days. In the middle of the feast, Jesus went up. The Holy Spirit told him. So he went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled. He is teaching everyone in the middle of the feast. And he went there secretly. Which means that Jesus was led by the Spirit. I believe, you know how the Father works? The Father doesn't show you everything. Sometimes the Father only shows you one step, and you must finish the first step. All he knew was he must go secretly to Jerusalem. While he was there secretly, the Spirit stirred him in the middle of the feast to start teaching. 
and then he start teaching. So he was obedient to the dot, what the Holy Spirit wanted him to do. So he started teaching, and then the Jews marvel, saying, how does this man know the writings? The word writings is the word sometimes translated as letters uh, uh, called grammar, uh, for which you get the word grammar. But the graph is from grapho, which is like writing. Having never learned. So the first thing that strike, strike, strike them is, how does he know the scriptures? He knows the Bible. Now the writings doesn't refer to ordinary writing. It's another reference to all the writings of the scriptures. So, the, they, they were saying, he knows the scriptures. He knows the Bible. That should tell them, because he was never... You know how long it takes the Jews to train? Yes, as long as a training for Catholic priests, long, long years. But here, Jesus was trained by God, and He knew all the scriptures like that. You can be the same way. And <clears throat> see, it does not matter whether People say, you know, you don't need Bible school training, all those things. Yes, but you need one training. You need to know the Bible. The one thing you, nobody can run away if you want to serve God in the ministry is to know the Bible, which is what Bible study is for. So you know the Bible thoroughly. <clears throat> so they were surprised. How does this man know? He said, he never studied. I mean, he did study, but he did study with them. He didn't attend, attend any of the Jewish schools. And then Jesus answered, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he will know concerning the doctrine whether it is of God or whether I speak of my own self. So he began to challenge them. Remember, all the time they want to kill him. He's speaking to people who want to kill him. He who speaks from his own self seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Let's go to the next verse. And uh, his confrontation is coming one after the other. And here comes Jesus and says, Did not Moses give you the law? <coughs> And yet none of you keep the law. So they say, what, 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 what do you mean? We, we keep the law. Say, no, you're not keeping the law. <clears throat> and basically, he stood up and told his killers, why do you seek to kill me? <laughs> he confronted them. He says, Moses' law says, thou shall not kill. Say, you never keep your law because you want to kill me. Ah, they are stunned and they actually want to kill him. Uh, look at what the people call him. Remember I said we are recording what people call them. The people answer and say, you have a demon. <laughs> Who is seeking to kill you? See, the people don't know. The normal people don't know that there are bad guys among the Jews who actually want to kill him. Because the people who want to kill Jesus are not advertising they want to kill him. So the people who are innocent say, he's talking nonsense now. But that's right. Remember the people? Okay, some people say, he has a demon. Wasn't that the same people, the people who also say he is good? Now the people are saying he is demon, which is worse than bad. Calling you a demon is already calling you bad. You cannot trust what people say about you. People's words will always keep changing. If you want to receive approval, receive approval from God. 
if up to today you still live your life based on wanting people's approval, you are still a baby. You have not matured in life. You have not woken up to the fact that in this life, as long as there is demons, there is devil, there is bad people and there is good people, you cannot trust what people say. You can only trust what God say. And there's only one person that you want approval from. God. If you haven't grown up to do that, you really haven't grown up. And you will be hurt if you're still trying to please people. So, they did say he, is, he has a demon. And let's read on. Why do they call him, say he's a demon? Now, what about these people here? I think that, that some of them are quite innocent. Correct? It's not, it's not the people who want to kill him. No. The Jews are the ones who want to kill him. And the Jews are plotters. Remember how they kill, they, in the end, how, you know how they kill Jesus? Okay, let me describe how, what they do with Jesus just very briefly. Do you know why they arrest Jesus at night? Because they are afraid of arresting him in the daytime. The Jews are afraid of the people. Because the thousands are healed by him. If they want to arrest him while he's healing the thousands, they are afraid the people, the mob might kill them. Or protect Jesus. So that's why they arrest him at night. And normally you have to wait a day or two and keep the person in, uh, in jail while waiting to be tried at the Sanhedrin Council. Correct? That's the proper method. Instead, they quickly call a special meeting to try Jesus in the middle of the night. Can you see how unfair it is? Talk about justice. And they call a special meeting to decide whether Jesus is guilty or not. And their minds were already made up. It all happened very fast. And when Jesus, you know, Claim that he was Christ, which is the truth. They said, blasphemy! <laughs> and they condemned him, and that's it, sentence done. No more, no more, no more trial. No more hearing. The way they tried Jesus is so unfair. They never even give a proper trial. It was to rubber stamp what they want to do. The verdict was already passed. They were already there saying he's guilty. And they just want a rubber stamp that he's guilty. They just carry out the motion. Oh yeah, we had a meeting. But if you check when they had a meeting, uh, around 2, 3 a.m. Nobody, no, there's never been a Sanhedrin Council meeting like that. It's all a mockery of justice. Not only that, they even prepare false witnesses. They tweak the court, court system because the Jewish system is based on two, three witnesses, correct? So they got false witness. They pay them money to tell half truth. So two of them say, yeah, 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 he did say he would destroy the temple. That's it. No chance for Jesus to defend himself. And Jesus, by the way, that's part of suffering, eh? Getting you ready. No chance for Jesus to defend himself. That is called a crucifixion. And Jesus actually was not talking about destroying the real temple. You and I know that. But in the heat of the whole thing, everybody's words were all over the place. Injustice favors confusion. Righteousness favors peace and calmness. So, the people were confused. The Jews were the plotters. The Jews are secret plotters. 
Remember, Jesus condemned the Pharisees because they secretly do evil. Whereas the publican, if they do sin or anything, the publican admit it publicly. But these secret plotters, Jesus says, you seek to kill me, he told the Jews. Jesus was telling the truth, but the people don't know the truth because the people didn't know the Jews were trying to kill Jesus. So they say, who is seeking to kill you? See, they didn't know. They were blur blur. This, the word people, uh, you can, in Singapore, replace the word uh, sotong. <laughs> the cuttlefish. All the cuttlefish say, Ala, you got demon lah, Pontiana. Ala, what got such thing? You know, who's trying to kill you? See, they are dumb dumb. They are not aware of something Jesus knew. Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work. Now you know what the one work was? The one man, he healed on the Sabbath day. And the man was carrying the bait. Every normal human would have said, Wow, so nice, huh? that Jesus heal you. They find fault because they don't like people to break the Sabbath day. Or rather, they actually don't like Jesus. Actually, they don't like Jesus. They're just using Sabbath day as an excuse to find fault. They really dislike him. They want to kill him. I did one work and you all marvel. Moses gave you circumcision, not because it's from Moses, but from far, the, uh, of the fathers. And if, the, if you, it's happened to be Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, you circumcise a man to fulfill the law. So Jesus said, if a man on the Sabbath receives circumcision, then the law of Moses should not be broken. Are you angry at me because I make a man completely whole? Can you see the logic of Jesus? Flawless. Jesus said, on the Sabbath day, you cut and you sleep. On the Sabbath day, I put a person together. So? 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 His logic was flawless. They got no answer. He said, are you angry that I make a man whole? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? See, confirmation! Some of them agree that he is, they are trying to kill him. But the people say, hey, who is trying to kill you? The Sotong, I don't know. But actually there's a plot to kill Jesus. But behold, he speaks boldly. And they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? Now, who is this? Some. Okay, let's look. Some of them. So, some of them say, He is Christ. Can you see? Eh? I put the some as the others. Eh? So, some of them say, He deceived people. Mm. Oh, no, no. He's the Christ. Oh. How come to trust people like that? Right? Just a moment ago, you say that he's a demon or deceiver. Ten minutes later, no, no, he's the Messiah. Why la, their opinion keep changing like that? And, uh, <clears throat> so their opinions are always changing, shifting to and fro. And, uh, <clears throat> Continue with our Lord Jesus Christ. We are right down to 26 by now. And so now they say, Hey, he, 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 this is really the Christ. Because he's so bold. And, and he speaks. And however, ah, here's another. <laughs> what is this however? If he's the Christ, he's the Christ. La! However. <laughs> What la this? Why you ding dong, ding dong, ding dong? Can either you dong or you ding. <laughs> so, is this truly the Christ? However, oh, we know this man where he is from. 
When Christ, Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Where do they get that doctrine? <laughs> so, where, what else did they say? Huh? Let's put it to the others. Lah. Okay. Don't know, don't know, don't know him. Ah. Don't know him. Don't know where he's from. Ah. If Christ comes, everyone will know. He is maybe from Jerusalem, from the school of the rabbi, brought up under Gamaliel and Gamaliel's teacher, and brought up under all these philosophers. Right? We know where he's from. So they say, don't know lah, this one, don't know where he graduated. <laughs> don't know where he's from, where his hometown, don't know who he is. He is he. So because we don't know, cannot be Christ. What? You're basing him as Christ or not Christ based on your own ignorance. If you research his life, you will find he was born in Bethlehem. If you research his life, go and research us, his mother, the mother will tell you he was a special child born without any human being. Correct? They don't want to do research. Don't want to search further. They just say, I want to be Sotom. I want to be blah blah, I don't want to know anything, so since I don't know anything, I don't have to know, maybe he's not the Christ. Oh my. There is no Bible verse that says, cuttlefish go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so don't go to heaven. So, why be blah blah? Then he said, then some say, right, some say we don't know where he's from. Then another group say, hey, we know, we know where he's from. <laughs> Can you make up your mind? One group say, don't know where he's from. Another group say, oh, we, we know where he's from. He's from Galilee. And if, if, if Christ, where Christ comes from, no one knows. You know, so what, what's, what's he saying? We don't know where he's from. We know where he's from. Confusing people. So let's do the group. Another group say, oh, we know. <laughs> we know where. Some say, don't know where he's from. Some say, I, I, he, we know where he's from, he's from Galilee. See, any prophet come out from Galilee, right? So, some, when they know him, they want to know him in the natural. Very confusing. This group of people. And so they're so confused. And then Jesus cried out. Now, this is interesting. Look at this Greek word here. The cry out uh, is krazo, which means to call, to scream, or to cry out loud. Now, we have to harmonize with the other Bible verse in Isaiah that says that when the Messiah comes, he will not raise his voice in the street. So, all I, I would say is based on this Greek word, that Jesus, you know, the people say, no way it's from, don't know where it's from, got demon, no demon, or got demon, deceive, where, where, Jesus raised his voice and say, you know, he, he raised his voice higher and said, you both know me and you know where I am from. Wow, settle that question. He answered that question. He wanted them to believe. So he actually raised his voice higher. You both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come on myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you know not. So Jesus did try to proclaim. And he says in the next verse, But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. When a person is sent by God, everyone who rejects him becomes accountable. I repeat again. When a person is sent by God, everyone who rejects him is accountable. And the sin of rejecting one sent from God is greater than all the sins of the sinners. Who committed this sin? The Pharisees. And to them belong the greater condemnation, that Jesus says. And when he did that, then they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him. Because, and look at this, his hour, now not just time, 
His hour had not yet come. He could not be silent. He could not be taken because it was not time to be crucified. So God protected him. No one could touch him because Jesus was doing God's perfect will. He was exposed right in public because you know the Jews, uh, they always play backhand man. You know, they arrest Jesus secretly. They try him secretly. By the time in the morning the people got up and looked for Jesus, Jesus was already before Pontius Pilate. No chance to be free again. Convicted and tried. The Jews always scheme. So you look at people who scheme, uh, if you see Christians who are scheming uh, and all that, uh, they are the modern Pharisees. People who are of God and of the light come to the light. And you could openly talk and discuss. People who scheme are exactly the same style as the Pharisees. They have long died, but the same spirit resides in those who oppose God. So, it tells us here, because of what Jesus did, and this is what Jesus wants to do, many of the people believe in Him. Hallelujah! And why they believe? When Christ comes, will He do more signs than these which this man has done? Yeah! Who are the people? Oh, the people! <laughs> the people! Look at all the people talking. So, finally, the people. Okay. The people believe. They believe Him because of His signs. They believe the signs. So, see how the people keep changing, shifting, changing, shifting? But at least in the end, they believe. The people, okay. Good demon, wow, one time call him demon. Don't know, we know where he's from. Then in the end, they believe in him. Not, not, not bad, at least some of them believe in him. So, they say, can there be any other Christ? And then in verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. Now, in the world, in our modern world today, there are a lot of people who claim to be Christ. There's one in Siberia, I think there's one in... Uh, Australia. Oh, oh, Australia got another one. Uh. My God. There's one in Brazil, there's one, I think it's Korea, one in different places. But one thing, uh, none of them could do what Christ did. They cannot do what Christ did. They might not even heal a mosquito. <laughs> when Christ comes, He will do the same signs and wonders. And in this end time, God will send you out with signs and wonders. He will send you with the Holy Spirit. Because our God is a God of miracles. So, they, they believe Him. So the Pharisees heard the people murmuring such things. So the people, the Pharisees are now scared. Because he heard the people saying, He's Christ, He's the Christ, He's the Christ, He's the Christ, we believe He's the Christ. Oh, the Pharisees are now panicking. Remember, they are the plotters, they are in the minority. But they are the one who get all the authority, spiritual authority and uh, political authority. And it says here, they, Pharisees, they, they send officers to arrest him. They send temple soldiers. So the officers are temple soldiers. They got weapons. They carry weapons. They are allowed to carry weapons. And Jesus said to them, Yet a little while I'm with you, and then I go unto him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am there you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where is he going? Uh, that we cannot find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? They just don't know what he's saying. And what is this Logos that he said? You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, then you cannot come. And so they didn't understand. But there was a confrontation in the middle of the feast. In the 
we end on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, same word, cried out loud, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he spoke of the Spirit whom those believing in him will receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So he prophesied. Now here's the thing. I checked because Jesus says, the scripture has said. It's very hard to find a verse exactly like that. He said, out of his belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. Do you realize that? I look at every translation possible and it was hard to find a direct verse. So what scripture is Jesus referring to? And the best that I could put together was uh, the closest fulfillment was Isaiah 58, 11. There are several that talk about rivers here but the river is not just a river. There are scriptures that talk about river flowing in the desert. But it has to be a river that is flowing from your inside. And that one is tough. I look for every scripture. I challenge you, go and look for scripture. Which scripture is Jesus quoting from? Jesus somehow, the closest he could find was Isaiah 58, 11. And then when you look at Isaiah 58, 11, Isaiah 58, 11, which was among the closest verse, because most of the concordance will point you to a scripture about river. I know, because I checked all of them. But it is not just a river. They, most of the cross are river flowing here, river flowing there, river flowing that land, river flowing in the desert, river flowing everywhere. But this is a river flowing from your innermost being. And so I guess this is the closest. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. Strengthen your bones. You shall be like a water garden. And this is not talking about a piece of land. This is talking about your soul. You. You will be like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And when you look carefully, I, I, do you know why I'm interested in the scripture? Because I'm interested in where he's getting it from and what the other scriptures related to this tell me. I don't want to just look at the one verse. I want to see the context of where the verse is coming from. And that's why I search. I challenge you, look at your concordance and cross-reference. Every one of them never put this verse. They put a cross-reference to some other river here, river there, river here. But that, I mean, you, you cannot just say people river. This is a river that is from a human being, not an ordinary river. So this was the closest I could find. And the reason is I wanted the context. And when you look at the context of this verse, it is such a blessing. Because chapter 58 says, Lift up your voice like the trumpet. Remember I talked about the Feast of Trumpets? Ha ha. And he says, there are people who seek God and some are fasting, some are not getting the answers they want and uh, their fast might not be in the right attitude, all kinds of things. Then he says, all your fast is so selfish, but this is the fast that you should do. You should be kind, love the poor, help the poor, help the homeless, help the... It should be a, out of love, out of compassion for people. Not of not of a selfishness for your own self to enrich yourself, but to help people. Verse eight, then your light shall bring forth, break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. This is talking about this end time revival. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he shall say, Here I am. 
you take away the yoke from your midst of pointing the finger, speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry, see this is about being compassionate and kind, then the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. Strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the bridge, the restorer of streets to dwell in. This is new, building New Jerusalem. If you turn away your food from the Sabbath by doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord is honourable and shall honour Him not doing your own way, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words, but you delight yourself in the Lord. I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Remember, Feast of Tabernacle? Feast of Tabernacle has a tie to New Jerusalem. So this is like restoring New Jerusalem to a certain extent. Let's get back to Gospel of John. Chapter 7. Remember, this is in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the outpouring of the Spirit shall reach its fullness when it's reached its fullness when the on the day of pentecost the spirit came in the feast of trumpets the spirit will enter its fullness the seven trumpets tie to the seven spirits and the seven spirits point to the seven churches the seven churches point to the set overcomers of all the seven churches which have all the seven spirits of God, which reach the fullness. See, only in this end time does the seven spirits get released in fullness. All they saw was the outpouring, but we see the seven spirits of God. And that's why it's more defined. It's like, you know, originally all you saw was, you know, uh, oh, electricity, it can do a lot of things, can give light. Now you know electricity can power your iPhone, power your iPad, power your computer, do a lot of other things. So at first they have the Holy Spirit, but now you see seven spirits becoming more defined because we are in the end time to receive all seven spirits. So this is a restoration of New Jerusalem and what we are doing in building Mount Zion is New Jerusalem because Hebrews 12 ties to Revelation 21 but Hebrews 12 is talking about this earth Revelation 21 is new earth so what we are doing the glorious church is called the bride correct so we are the bride New Jerusalem is the bride same bride New Jerusalem is the bride after marriage. This revival is the bride before marriage. So, this is the betrothal. betrothal. The voice that cried at midnight is telling, get ready for your bridegroom. The bride before marriage. Chapter 21 is the bride after marriage, called the Lamb's wife, Mrs. Lamb. <laughs> so this is the bride before, it's still building New Jerusalem and, and it must come from your inside, from your innermost being. And then, after all these things took place, and uh, look at verse 40, we're towards the ending now. Many of the people, ah, remember the people again? They ding dong, ding dong. Let's, let's see whether it's a dong or a ding. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this logo say, This is truly the prophet. Okay, not bad. <laughs> Actually, it's a demotion uh, from Christ to the prophet. But let's give them some positive. Uh. So, the people now say, 
He's a prophet. But it's not just a prophet, it's the prophet. In other words, the one that Moses talked about. And Moses said when he sent this prophet, listen to him. So in a way, they're acknowledging the Messiah. Not bad, the people at least got more positive now. Others say, the Christ! Okay, good, thank you very much, others. Now where are the others? Okay, others earlier say don't know. Now they say Christ, so they go back. Uh, they dong again. You know, ding, dong, ding, dong. Okay, he deceived. He's a Christ. Don't know that. Christ. Okay, thank you very much. So you're finally back on the good side. So the other said he's a Christ. And oh, oh, here comes. Some say, Alama, where does some come from? Some among the others says, mm, Wait a minute. You think Christ will actually come from Galilee? Ah? Shouldn't he come from Bethlehem, maybe Jerusalem, or somewhere like that? Nice place? What Galilee? You know, you think Christ can come from Aukang? You know? No, no, maybe, maybe he should come from, you know, District 10. <laughs> kind of thing, right? So, so you're, you're thinking, you know, he should be a, a, a he should be a president scholar, you know. Oh, you know, you know, president scholar. How can he be the Christ? <laughs> and um, so, ah, yeah, these people. Oh, oh what was the last thing they said. Okay, question mark again. So the others, ah, some say, you know, question mark. Galilee, <laughs> Galilee, Galilee. <laughs> So again, uh, unbelief come. So they're going backwards. Some, not all. And uh, let's look at what else is happening. And then another group who at least read the Bible, thank God, says, the Bible says, <laughs> and the scripture says, Christ comes from the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was. So they say, Galilee? So they didn't believe that Jesus was from Bethlehem. Nobody bothered to ask his mom. You know, it's so easy to find out, right? Hey, I mean, some, you know, sometimes people want to believe the wrong thing, they believe the wrong thing. It's so easy to just ask someone, hey, did this happen? People say, no, oh yeah, but I still believe that it happened. <laughs> what? <laughs> they could ask the mother. Is it uh, Mrs. Uh, mother of Jesus? Uh, is he from Bethlehem? The mother will say, Yes, I'm a witness. The cows are the witness. Got some shepherds witness. If they only ask, it will have supported the scriptures. And nobody, nobody, nobody did research. Everybody like to hear say like, what, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. La la, play become donkey. <laughs> At least Balaam's donkey was a better candidate. So maybe it's not donkey. It become Donkey Kong, right? so, uh, which is some video game called that. But. There was a division among the people. You know why they were divided? Because some believe, some don't believe. And some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. So, you know, all kinds of things. People were challenged. Then the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees came and they said to them, they said, why haven't you arrested him? <laughs> they said, well, why you come back without him? Uh, let's look at the answer. The officer says, No man spoke like this man. So they say, Don't know how to arrest. They, actually, the Holy Spirit restrained them. They just don't know what to do with Jesus. Then the Pharisees told the officers, Are you also deceived? What? They're so concerned. Even their, pol their, their, their police in their temple could not arrest Jesus. Because they say there's nothing wrong. And then look at their, their condition for them believing Jesus. This is their condition. 
have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believe in him? Huh? You mean, you mean only when you certify that Jesus is the Christ, then we can now believe? Huh? Who give you the right to certify? So their, their belief is, unless we believe, you cannot believe. Unless we say He is, you cannot say He is. Who gave them this authority? They take too much on themselves. Who make them God? To judge God, actually. Who made them God? And they're actually judging God. Because Jesus is God. Remember the last chapter? God seal him as God. What well, can you imagine uh, wanting to judge a God when they are not even worthy to judge? But they base it on themselves. This is how they, they want to see truth or error. They base it not on the Bible. They base it on themselves. Because we are the religious leader, we tell you what you can believe, what you cannot believe. No need to read the Bible, just follow us. Oh, that's what they are. Then look at what they consider the people. They are really very bad people. These people, that is the people who believe, who know not the law, they are cursed. Oh, they really look down. That is their secret view of the people. And uh, according to the old translation, uh, it tells us, this crowd does not know the, the uh, and they are a curse. But the Greek word actually say, the people are cursed. We are blessed. They are the cursed people. We are the blessing people. Oh, actually, actually, they are the cursed people. <laughs> According to Jesus, correct? Before Jesus went to the cross, He called them the woe people. Woe to you! Woe to you! Woe to you! Correct? They are the one who is cursed. The people are the one who is blessed. It is the pot calling the cattle black. When they themselves are as black as any others. Say, so look at how unjust they are. But there's a good guy among them. Nicodemus. He who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, he's a Sanhedrin council member, said to them, Does our law judge a man before he hears him and knows what he does? That's righteousness, correct? They answered, Are you also from Galilee? They never answered the question, you know. They never answered the question. He asked a very correct, righteous question. Does our law judge a man before it gives, it gives him a chance to hear his side of the story, to hear him and know what he does? The moment they, they hear him, uh, they say, Are you also from Galilee? Search! Look! There is no prophet comes from Galilee! La. That doesn't mean no prophet can arise from Galilee. That doesn't mean that. So, they never answer the question of righteousness. Because the, if they follow their own law, if they follow their own law, they must give Jesus a chance to present himself. And they must do proper research, innocent, unproven, guilty. They never. They are just blind. And they are cursed while calling other people cursed. And anyway, everyone was so stirred up. And then everyone just went home. <laughs> but the story not over. The story continued next week. <laughs> when it got more confrontation. Because this happened during the feast, right? It's feast time. So they were the last day of the feast. Wow, everyone's shaken by Jesus. So everyone said, go home, go home, go home. But look at the conclusion of the crowd. 
Right? Okay, so okay, we can just look at that upper screen. Ah, uh, he deceived his Christ. Don't know about him, his Christ. Galilee. People say, he's he's good. He's a demon. Ah, uh, we know where he come from. There is Galilee. Then some believe, and some say he's the prophet. On that day of the feast. Jesus got more people to believe in him. Those who are blind, who really don't want to believe, uh, they just confirm uh, that he's a demon. Because in chapter 8, they still keep calling him a demon. Chapter 8. Can you imagine Jesus Christ being called a demon? Who dare to call Jesus a demon? Think about that. Pharisees. People who put themselves on the seat of God. People who give themselves the authority to represent God when they have no authority at all. So this space, uh, you're gonna, we're going to fill in next week. <laughs> And you will see what they call Jesus. While the people accept him, the rulers of the Jews reject him. History now shows that the Jews were wrong, the people were right. Jesus is the Son of God. The Jews were the devil. Truth is always revealed at the end of a long line of history. In the midst of the controversy, people cannot see clearly. But in the end, when Jesus rose from the dead, the truth is established. One fine day at the judgment seat, the same Pharisees who call Jesus a demon will tremble together with other demons as they look at Jesus seated on the throne, forever condemned by their own words. They condemn themselves. Just like God told the Israelites when they didn't cross the land of Canaan, God says, Amen to your own words. And their own words condemn them to die in the wilderness in 40 years. So let's understand that it was not easy to believe Jesus even in Jesus' time. If you're exposed to the crowd, correct? So many opinions. So don't think that in our modern time, when God raises a voice or God gives us His Word or sends men and women of God, that it will be a clear-cut thing. There will always be the people. There will always be the Pharisees and Sadducees. There will always be the others. And there will always be the disciples of Jesus. No path in any generation is without controversy. How do we know the truth? By the Word of God. Search the Bible. Read the Scriptures. And make sure that every man and woman of God prove what God says to them by the Bible. And by signs and wonders of the good kind, miracles that help the weak, the sick, the dying, the lame, the blind. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will take us into the place of steadfast faith. We see the others, we see the people, we see the disciples. We thank God that throughout that time, 
the disciples remain steady, at least most of them. And we want to be like the disciples, steady as a rock to do all that you want to do in this end time. Let's arise together. faith alone is the faith that comes from Jesus we stand on his shoulder that's why we stand tall we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us who has established the good word of God into our lives we stand on the 
predecessors and men and women of great faith of 2,000 years. We thank you, Father. By your grace, you call us and chose us to be those of this end time. And we are grateful that we bear fruit which they have sown for 2,000 years. The fruit of many men and women of God. Some sow and some reap. We are those who are called to reap. The many seeds sown over 2,000 years of many tears and many lives and much blood loss. Now here we stand in the last hour of the end time, ready to be your bride. And we are grateful. Cause each one of us to have a steadfast spirit and a spirit like Joshua, strong and courageous because we are the generation that will enter the promised land that have been waiting for 2,000 years. We enter the manifestation of the Kingdom of God. The manifestation of the sons of God. We enter into the fullness of the call to be the perfect church. Ephesians 4, the fullness of Christ. We are yours, Lord. Here we are. Let it be unto us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering and God bless you.